Escredit. What's the most interesting anecdote an elderly person has told you that has significantly changed your views in life? Sometimes you're not meant to go over, or under, or around it. Sometimes, you're meant to go through it. You just have to get through it. Elderly client in a lucid state, describing his battle with dementia. Going on a bear hunt. I was at a close friend's wedding and most of his family was fairly well off. Many of them were feeling nostalgic because they were surrounded by family and everyone has grown up. Many said they regretted how many hours they worked when their kids were young in order to be a better provider. Up until recently I was making great money and working 60 plus hours a week. When I noticed what I was giving up I did some networking and took a job as a contractor in a small consulting company. I work 40 hours a week now and leave my laptop at the office and don't have work email on my phone. I now feel like more of a provider because I'm a lot more active in my family's lives and it's awesome. Where I am soon you'll be. Where you are I once was. A 66 year old told me that when I was 24. I am getting there fast I'm 51 now. It flew by. Really opened my eyes at 24 to elderly and change my views. Don't do more than one illegal thing at a time. That's what gets you caught. Security guard at my high school. It's good advice. Dude yes. I always tell my buddies never break the law when you're already breaking the law. But every episode of cops is some dingus getting a weed ticket because he was stupid enough to roll a stop sign or some dumb crap. My grandfather died in his 90s. A few months before his death he kept talking about his 17 year old brother who died in World War 2. I found it moving that of all the other people who had been and gone in his life. It was his young brother who he hadn't seen since the 1940s that he kept think of. I can't imagine how much he missed him. Met a woman in a nursing home while on clinicals who the nurses called a nightmare and a bee etc. Actually talked to her and she was not only incredibly kind, but also wise. Not an anecdote, but she said something she lived by was a poem she had memorized in grade school. Suppose, by Phoebe Carey. Just a snippet, but I recommend reading the whole thing. And suppose the world don't please you, nor the way some people do. Do you think the whole creation will be altered just for you? And isn't it, my boy or girl, the wisest, bravest plan? Whatever comes, or does end come, to do the best you can, she allowed me to record her reciting the poem. I'll remember her fondly, and I hope the nurses treated her well after we left. Met an elderly Hispanic lady at a bus stop in Albuquerque. We went back and forth in Spanish for a bit. I'm a white guy so she was pleasantly surprised, and she told me about her travel plans to go to her son's wedding. A real cute story involving him and his high school sweetheart finding each other after a long time being broken up. I had recently been dumped, and said something a bit mopey like I wish I could find love like that someday. She smiled. Shook her head and said Chico, love like that isn't just found, it's built. How men are perfect, decorated temples do you think my ancestors stumbled across in Tikal or Tenochtitlan? Number. They found a good, level spot, maybe some water nearby, and said here, we can build something here. Look for a clearing in the forest, young man, not a hidden city, that one will stick with me for years. Very reassuring words, and very true as well. Thank you for sharing. I spoke with a man in his 80s, Don Schoen, who survived the sinking of the USS Indianapolis. Yeah, the horror story about the sharks. Like, god dang. Kint's story in Jaws doesn't even do it justice. He told me about his experience, and all the subtle little things he could recall. Like how when the sharks would nibble at a dead body, the corpse would jerk down and bob back up like a cork on a fishing line. Yeesh. Or how the oil slick that formed on top of the water acted like sunblock. When Don was done telling me his story, he cried for his captain and the railroad job that was done on him. An old man in his 80s, openly weeping in front of me, and I was basically a stranger to him. The only thing the navy did for Don was give him 30 days leave and his station of choice. He chose to go up north to Washington and tried to process at the base there. The commander swore up and down that they didn't have his file and he didn't belong there, eventually telling Don if you can find your file in there, 
I'll sign your papers myself, meaning he would be released from the navy. Don found his file, got released from the navy that day, and moved to the San Francisco area. That guy did Don a real solid. In all, crap like this really puts life into perspective. I've had some wild times, but shark evasion isn't on that list. What I took away from it, aside from pure awe, is that you can overcome every obstacle presented to you, and it may not even matter. Other people's discretion still wields an ungodly amount of influence on where and when we go in life. We're all at the mercy of each other in some shape or fashion. Do right by each other. I hadn't heard of the disaster until this comment, so I looked it up. Ro, that's a lot. If you're going to do something stupid, do it smart. We were playing with fireworks at the time. That was a lesson that I've taken to every job I've worked at since. Every time I go to do a job I look it over and see the stupid things I am about to do. Dangerous parts of my job. And try to figure out how to do it smart. Figure out how to minimize the danger in my work. The rule of thumb in our house is if you'd feel dumb telling this story in the air. Find another way. The path looks tougher and longer before you start walking. My granddad used to say something similar to that, can't translate it perfectly. He passed away a couple of years back. When I think of him, I always remember these words. That's actually inspiring. Even true in everyday life. I'm sitting here wasting time on Reddit procrastinating studying for an exam. If I just started it would get easier but it's so hard to just pick up my laptop. My nanny grew up in rural NC after the Great Depression to a poor family. She had hundreds of great stories about life growing up on the Charles or her grandparents farm. But one that sticks with me, and will color how I raise my daughter, was about Christmas. She and her siblings believed in Santa, but they rarely got more than fruit or maybe new clothes as presents. She would return to school and see a little girl in her class that was a notorious bully and particularly cruel to nanny with fancy new dolls, new clothes, things money could get you and she felt awful because she believed she was doing her best to be a good student, to be a caretaker for her younger siblings, to follow her religious beliefs. Traditional Santa mythos tells you good gets rewarded but that's devastating for kids who work hard at following the rules, being kind, etc, and still get nothing. I used to tell my kids that those kind of kids got presents from their parents because Santa wouldn't. Once you become aware of a wrongdoing or injustice, the responsibility to correct that in yourself cannot be ignored. Basically if you know better, you're required to do better. Oluwale was his name. He was a family friend originally from Nigeria. He was super smart and very humbled. He taught 14 year old me a lot about self responsibility and has no idea how much that one thing clicked for me and changed my life. I had a history professor say something similar that has always stayed with me. We were discussing injustices and he said if you think to yourself someone should do something about that, you need to be the one to do it. My grandfather served in World War II. He told me that his first term of service was just days too short to exempt him from further service. He had to return for another two years. At first I was angry at the injustice, but then he explained that it was during his second term that he met my grandmother, who was working as a nurse. Things happen for a reason, he said, like that, and like me. He passed away about 10 years ago, but I've never forgotten. Next time you get frustrated about a minor, or major, inconvenience, remember, you may get grandchildren out of it, or in my case, existence, tl, dr, my entire family wouldn't exist if my grandfather wasn't forced to serve two extra years in world war 2 due to a technicality. Once you best a man, never gloat, be generous and find something in his actions to praise, he won't enjoy being bested but he'll make a good face about it, show him you appreciate it. Praise can win you a friend. Gloating will only ever make enemies. My grandpa. My old friend. He was 99. Hated when people said, if only it was like the good old days. He would always say something along the lines of the good old days. Picking cotton every day for $2 a week wasn't the good old days right now are the good days. I wish there was a way to know you're in the good old days before you've actually left them. For our whole adult lives, my husband and I have dealt with our parents crapping on what we've got. Our house isn't nice enough. Jobs don't pay well enough. Wedding wasn't fancy enough. 
It's like they never had to struggle through early adulthood. We've done everything on our own while his siblings all live with his mother and have all their expenses paid. I was talking to my husband's grandmother one day and she told me how she once sat in her husband's lap and sobbed because their neighbor was going on yet another vacation and they were struggling just to pay the bills. His other grandmother, when she saw our house for the first time, called it a darling little house and told us about how her first apartment with her husband had an awful silverfish infestation. Those talks helped me feel like it's okay to not have the nicest of everything right now. We have years to reach the point our parents did, and there's no rush to have fancy vacations or a huge house. Silverfish infestation. Freaking kill me now. For my college religion class, we visited a Jewish synagogue and observed their service. They have a ritual where they pray for loved ones who have died, and an old woman, 80-90, participated with tears in her eyes. The rabbi explained to us that she was a holocaust survivor, and only she was able to escape as a girl. She didn't know if anyone in her family was dead or alive, but since they're presumed dead, she still prays for them every service. That really hit me, because people my age tend to think of the holocaust as more of a historical event that happened a long time ago. But for these people, it's ever present in their lives. They also had a Torah that was badly burned that had been recovered from the holocaust. I think as a reminder of those that were lost. That's the mourners Kaddish. It's always at the end of every service, though the translation doesn't really have anything to do with death mourning. On the topic of what to be when we grew up, my grandfather responded with I still don't know what I want to be when I grow up. My grandfather was in the navy and then served as a police officer for 4 decades. Him saying that really put into perspective that no one really has a set plan, and that we are all just doing the best we can with what we've got. I felt that way a few years ago. I worked in a factory for 25 years that closed. I was 62 and didn't know what to do. I decided to go back to college and get an AA degree in accounting. What was great was most of the other students were just out of high school yet they treated me like I was one of them. A street preacher who was homeless told me to stop being a coward and switch to the career I wanted. He had earlier helped me when I was lost in bad part of the town I was living in. We talked for a while, him about his life, me about mine. He told me that he worked in finance for years before quitting because he was miserable, had forsaken his physical possessions, and decided to live on the street and spread the gospel. We had very similar educational backgrounds. He didn't want anything, except a promise that I wouldn't waste his advice. I never saw him again. If you believe in angels, it would be hard to find a better candidate than him for being one. I followed his advice and I'm very happy I did. Just gonna leave this here. Hebrews 13. 2. Be not forgetful to entertain strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. From a World War II vet my father told me that real men don't cry, frick him. He told us a story about how he watched aircraft explode and burn while paratroopers were dropping into other aircraft's propellers. Real men do cry. That's so awful. Nobody wants the truth, they just want to be right was told that by my dad one day and that really made my life with my parents easier. The way I try to live my life is to form my opinions based on the truth. I'm not defending one side or another just because, if people don't like it, too bad, I made an informed decision. We talked to an elderly Amish man who had recently lost his wife. My wife asked him more about her and he said with tears in his eyes I had 60 years with her and it wasn't enough when I think of this and my marriage, it gives me some serious perspective when things are tough. I befriended a guy at the pub one day named Ben. He never gave me a straight answer when asked about his age, but from his stories I could discern he was likely in his 80s. We had basically the same pub schedule and became really good acquaintances. He always asked me how my workday was. Sincerely interested. One day, it was the end of the week, and a very difficult week. I had grown increasingly frustrated with the ineffectual management. I really enjoyed my job, but the aggravation could often be just too much. Ben listened to my rant, remained thoughtfully silent for a bit. He then told me about the factory job that he actually really liked. 
It was hard work for sure, but it was challenging and, at the end of the day quite satisfying. Management viewed the workers as numbers though, and didn't really care if some were working harder than others. Then new management came in, rolled out all kinds of unnecessary changes, adding more responsibilities to the workers without any incentives. Ben really loved his job, though he was getting more and more frustrated and it started to become unbearable for him. So one weekend, he's at a pub, by himself, ruminating over his job. I asked myself, what can I do to change the situation aside from looking for another job, which I did not want to do. How can I change this situation and I realized, I can't. I can't change the situation. And if I can't change the situation, then I need to change the way I relate to the situation. He just nodded and smiled at me. I retired from that place happy and quite well off. Took me some time to really digest that seemingly simple nugget of wisdom I received 25 years ago. It informs much of my existence, professionally, socially, whatever, to this day almost on a daily basis. If I am in an undesirable situation that I can't get out of, I need to change my perspective of the situation. I miss you Ben. That's basically stoic philosophy in a nutshell. You might find it interesting to skim meditations by Marcus Aurelius and see basically the same sentiment from a Roman emperor 2000 years ago. For me, it sort of drove home that people have always been people, and we're still wrestling with the same sorts of things. I was in my mother's kitchen, when I asked great Jima what was her favorite tool in the kitchen. She looked at the fridge, oven, microwave oven, food processor, toaster, ETC paused and replied running water. She had homesteaded in northern Saskatchewan over a 100 years ago. Her reply now causes me to evaluate every gadget that enters the house, and how does it contribute to the basics that we need in our life. Ro, that'll put things in perspective for sure. Interesting. Thanks for sharing this. I met a former concert pianist who had woken up from brain surgery to discover he had lost fine motor control in his hands. He went from performing at the Sydney Opera House to being unable to play a simple melody. The work required to get to that level is brutal and requires so much sacrifice from a young age. I was amazed by the peace he had made with his situation. He had transitioned into teaching, which is what many performing artists eventually do, just much later in life and talked about the joy he got out of it. It stuck with me as proof that you can get through anything with the right perspective. Not an anecdote but I remember moaning about work to a friend of my dad's once. Guy was in like his late 80s. He let me have my rant and simply said, the weather's not nice, but it's the only weather we've got. Took me a couple of years to properly understand that what he really meant was that the situation might suck but if there's not much you can do to change it right now, don't get too down about it. My 93 year old grandmother recently told me, life is hard and sad for everyone, and because of that no, one looks bad when they're dancing because it's an expression of joy. I was making homemade hard cider and was getting a little short with my mom because I couldn't find the measuring cup to get the measurements exact. My grandpa stepped in and said, Legito, it's freaking alcohol not some science experiment. Just eyeball and get close to the measurements and it'll be fine I promise. I've done it all my life and people love what I make. For some reason what he said clicked something in me and I kind of stopped worrying about stupid things after that. And how the hard cider turned out you asked? tasted like absolute crap. This one's my favorite. It just feels true to life, especially the last bit. Words of wisdom from my mom who was a child of the Great Depression and a Rosie in World War II when I would be about my crappy first job in retail. Me crap people crap pay crap job blah blah. How oh, but did you get to work today? For years I thought that she was reminding me of road danger. Did I arrive? What she was really saying was hey butthole kid. You got to work, not beg or stand on a breadline or go fight Nazis like her brother died doing. As I hit my 40s it struck me, the jobless 2009 to 2010 period due to economic meltdown. Oh, did you get to work today? Rip your mean old woman. As a currently unemployed dude, yeah. We sat down and interviewed my grandfather about his life. He went from growing up on a farm in rural India and leaving school aged about 12 to a radio engineer for British Airways. He's achieved a lot and now his family are spread all over the world, working as doctors, engineers and artists, 
but still make time to come to India to see him. I'm in India for his 90th birthday now. We asked him how he felt about his legacy and he just said he's content. He has lived a good life and provided a better life for his children. It made me really re-evaluate how I define my successes. I used to focus on if anything I did would ever hang in a museum. But now that doesn't seem as important as making my family happy. Happy birthday to your grandfather. One lady told a story about getting sent home from school for having dirty hands. See, when she was not in school, she helped her dad in the auto shop, which was cool enough by itself. She could tear apart and rebuild an engine like nobody's business. Her dad was angry and ordered the teacher to come out to the shop and get her hands dirty or he would report her to the board. She did, and by the end of about 3 days, he explained to that teacher that their auto business was directly important to the war effort, World War II, because people would bring in their cars counting on them to be ready for the next day so they could get to work, where many of them worked to make supplies for the war. No car, no work, fewer supplies, it all affected the war effort. She and her dad sometimes worked all night to get those cars done leaving little time to clean up, sleep, and get to school. After working in the shop, that teacher never said anything about having dirty hands again. That is a pretty cool story. I lived in a town of 50 people and there was this old man Chuck who lived alone in a cabin he built on an oversized trailer. He was a recovered alcoholic with emphysema. He had a great big beard and no teeth. He fought in Vietnam and had worked as a butcher and cowboy, and we would sit and smoke cigarettes together. One day we were chatting and he said to me you think you're real hot crap don't you and I didn't know what to say, and he said I used to be real hot crap too. She wasn't elderly, but she was an adult in 1994 and when I was in high school that was old enough, right? She was a Tootsie woman who had survived the Rwandan genocide who came to my high school to talk about her experiences. She started with an educational primer, where she talked about how Hutu and Tutsi were initially class titles and very fluid, depending on how well you were doing, but during Belgian occupation the titles became unchangeable race markers. During the Q&A afterward, one of my classmates asked who she would say was ultimately to blame for the genocide. Most of us expected the Belgians to be mentioned, since they're the ones who racialized the groups. But her actual answer was everyone who picked up a gun or machete and killed someone because of something over which they had no control. Completely changed my outlook on race relations, politics, genocide, almost everything. Also, if you're thinking of watching a movie about the genocide, she said avoid Hotel Rwanda because it's kind of a Disneyfication. She showed us sometimes in April instead. My dad says whenever you're at a social function you should always talk to old people. Old people love helping young people. Young people are just looking to take. Earlier I was talking to this old guy in his mid 70s who lived in the apartment next to mine. He was telling me about his work, travel, and life in general. I remembered my grandpa and grandma who used to tell me stories too. That's why I asked this question. Old people are so soft yet so full of life. Life is a punishment. Everyone lives in their own private heck designed to cause them horrific pain. But just as how you can find a life-giving oasis in the harsh desert or a lush island in a stormy sea, there will always be a small area of heaven surrounded by the fires and horrors of life. That small area is filled with the people you love, the things you actually want and dreams. Find that goddamn place and never freaking leave it. Guard it with everything you've got. That's the key. A wise old soldier I knew. One who fought in World War II, Vietnam and Korea. Pops my gold cherry. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.